This is Greater LA on KCRW, the show that connects you to the people, the places, and the film Footprints of Southern California. Welcome. I'm Steve Chiotakis. Maybe you're not old enough, but do you remember the heavy-hitting comedy duo Abbott and Costello? They had some incredibly funny back and forths, including this one. I'm telling him. You said none yet. Go ahead and tell me. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. You know the guy's I'll... name's on the baseball team? Yes. Well, go ahead. Who's on first? Yes. I mean the guy's name. Who? The guy playing first. Who? The guy playing first base. Who? The guy on first base. <laughs> Who is on first? Why are you asking me for? I don't know. Now, wait a minute. I'm not... <laughs> That's probably their most famous. The two of them had comedic timing like few others. And the story goes like this. In one of their episodes that we couldn't find for the life of us, they're trying to sell black vinyl records. And one says to the other, they could sprinkle some cornstarch on the bottom and call them licorice pizzas. Well, that's where the name came from for a chain of popular record stores here in Southern California. This Christmas, I'm giving music. Prince's Purple Rain. It's going to be a very purple Christmas. On sale at Licorice Pizza for $6.99 on LP or cassette. LP for you kids stands for long playing, as in records. And Licorice Pizza sold LPs and cassettes and eight tracks all over the Southland, including in the San Fernando Valley, where director Paul Thomas Anderson grew up. So what better way to pay homage to that old store that's long gone than to name a movie after it, a movie that's been getting really good reviews so far and tells the story of growing up and falling in love in what seemed like a simpler time. Anderson directed Boogie Nights, There Will Be Blood, Punch Drunk Love, The Mass. You've heard about many of his movies over the years. And Paul Thomas Anderson joins us right now. Welcome, Mr. Director. Well, thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> How'd you like that introduction, intro. by the way? I yeah. loved it. I loved it. I, the purple rain is taking me back. <laughs> <laughs> and it, th there is not enough time to read all of your credits. So let's just start off with the one that opens in limited release this weekend, a movie that you not only directed but wrote as well called Licorice Pizza. Is, is this your life story? No, it's not my life story, <clears throat> um, but, but it sure is close. Um, the details of it belong to a, a very good friend of mine named Gary Getzman, who's gone on to become a successful Hollywood movie producer. But in his youth, he started out as a, a child actor. And when that really wasn't going the way that he planned or he saw that its future was limited, he got in the business of uh, selling waterbeds. Hmm. Uh, he was walking on Hollywood Boulevard past a wig shop one day. Mr. Jack's wig shop used to be on Hollywood right near Vine. And he, he looked inside and, and deep in the back, there was a waterbed. And he, <laughs> he was drawn to it like a, like a magnet. What is that? And the guy said, it's a bed made of water. And the next thing you know, Gary Getzman started Fat Bernie's Environmental Living. They had store, a store in Encino. And they did a lot of advertising on KPPC. You know, this was the days of COD. So him and his friends would sell waterbeds. A UPS guy would turn up, take the waterbeds, come back at the end of the day, deliver them an envelope full of cash. And they, they were convinced <laughs> they were <laughs> millionaires, you know. <laughs> C COD, by the way, for you kids, is cash on delivery. <laughs> so when it gets delivered to you, you pay the man or woman who delivers it to you. So just so you know. That's right. <laughs> I, I, I want to I play a little bit of the trailer, if we, if we will. Do you know uh, who my girlfriend is? Barbara Streisand? Barbara Streisand. Sand. Sand, yeah, like sands. Like the ocean, like beaches. Barbara Streisand? <sighs> no, but Streisand. Sand. Sand. But the film is a sad thing for This is fate that brought us together. But she's lived it ten times or more. Our roads took us here. She could spit in the eyes of fools. You're not my director. They ask her to focus on. Do you really want to see my boobs? Can I touch them? See you tomorrow. I said simpler times in your introduction, Paul, but but was it a simpler time or just a younger time? Ha, you know, it's funny when you when you said that, it, it made me think um, your first response is, yes, it was a simpler time. And then <laughs> you think, but hang on. No, it wasn't. Um, I'll tell you, the first thing I thought of was um, we were lucky enough when we were shooting this movie, not lucky enough, that sounds really perverted. What I'm going to say is that unfortunately, there were the fires from last summer when we were shooting. And the, so the sky was red. I don't know if you remember, but there was about, you know, it was a good two months when it was just covered in, in ash. But it, 
Oh, yeah. The result was that it looked like the valley in 1972. Um, So smog is it from the smog. So you think, was it a simpler time? Yeah, it was simpler, but we were choking on on smog. Um, We have a plot line that's hard to talk about without revealing too much, but it involves a political candidate whose personal life at that time, if it had emerged, would have would have ruined his chances. Um, the, yes, we can look back and it was an innocent time and we didn't have phones and there was more mystery. We didn't know where everybody was, that we would think about them more. But on the other hand, there's a lot that's 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 changed for the better. You know, I think um, particularly as it re- as it works for this story, which people seem to be responding to is that um, the, there's more mystery. There's mysteries, particularly in, you know, finding people. Um um or running to running into them on the street maybe you meet a girl you think about her she's more mysterious to you because you can't you don't know every single last thing about her this is more appealing for sure there there's a nostalgia obviously for a, a different time in the valley in the film do you do you spend time there how do you how do you think it's changed well i spend plenty of time uh there because i live here um i live in the san fernando valley um I have all my life and has it changed? Yeah. Yeah. It's changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the street's still the same width. The shape of the buildings are essentially the same. Um, it doesn't take that much to kind of squint your eyes and time travel. Maybe some of the, a lot of the details are different. So when you're making a film, it becomes, it, it's a struggle to recreate it. But, um, you know, if, if you widen out and you look at it, um, the landscape of it hasn't changed that much. A lot of these houses that were there from the beginning, you know, these sort of a 50s apartment complex, late 40s houses, a lot of them still remain. There are a number of scenes in the movie of the main characters who are running. They're running all over the place from from scene <laughs> to scene. And it struck me because, you know, this is this is L.A. People, few people walk. Maybe they do. I don't want to get hammered for that. There are, there are people who walk in L.A., but we are certainly known for cars in this town. Is that how you remember things in the Valley? People just going from one place to another on foot? No, that is a convention. Of, that, that is that is that's the movies. That's why it's a movie. Um, I remember riding my BMX bike around. I remember taking the RTD. I remember desperately trying to form friendships with older uh kids to get a ride somewhere um the running in the movie is it really serves it serves as a special effect it serves as a dynamic way to make a a story come alive more than a realistic portrayal of what life is like in the valley (laughs) because no you don't spend much time running you went to school at Santa Monica College, which, um, in full disclosure, is holds the license to KCRW, by the way. D- did you believe that would get you to where you are today? That, you know, not only Santa Monica College, but going to school. I want to be a director. I want to be in the movies. Yeah. Well, well that's well, I, I when I was in high school and the filmmakers that I was looking up to, they all had resumes that started in, at film school. Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Martin Scorsese, um, Oliver Stone, the, the generation of filmmakers that I admired, Spike Lee, came out of film schools. So if you wanted to do it, that was the road that you took. And I didn't get into any film schools at a high school. I didn't have I was rege- every rejection letter you could get. And I was very scared. I, I was sort of convinced that my career was over. If I couldn't get into film school, how am I going to possibly learn how to make films? So I ended up at SMC mercifully. And in that time, I was able to, to readjust. And a few filmmakers came around. Steven Soderbergh, I remember. Oh, you start to realize, well, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't have to go to school. Maybe I can actually just start learning how to do this on my own. Maybe I can buy American Cinematographer magazine. Maybe I can take the <laughs> film course at Santa Monica College. And But in the meantime, you know, I have more a little bit more time on my hands. I could just work on film sets. So I look back at that time and say, thank God, you know, thank God I didn't get stuck in a film school um, that would, I'd still be paying off the loans now or my dad, you know, asking my dad for the cash. Um, And I think it served me quite well, but 
um, and nowadays I don't think, I don't think anybody's thinking that you have to go to film school to learn how to make a film. Every kid's got a film studio in his pocket. So you've worked with a huge list of big name actors in, in your films, Daniel Day Lewis, Julianne Moore, Burt Reynolds, Mark Wahlberg, Joaquin Phoenix, but, but the leads in this film are pretty young and unknown, uh, including Alana Hyam and her sisters, who are also in the movie. Mm -hmm. They're in the band, Hyam. How did you decide on on them for those parts? Well, I've known Alana and her sisters as a band for a number of years. Um, We've been working, doing music videos and things like that together. But flashback even further, their mother was my elementary art school teacher. I was seven or eight years old. She taught me art, and I remembered her... She made the most incredible impression on me um, and to the point where I'd kept paintings that I'd made with her th- through my entire adult life. I hung on to moving from house to house. So I have a deep connection to this family. Now, it's one thing to think of somebody's work as in a rock band and, 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 and work with them. But it's another thing to think that they can be the star of a movie. And I... I suppose it's a combination of instinct and experience and just sort of gut that made me look at Alana and think, I, 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 she can do this. She can do this. And more to the point, she could do it really, really, really well. Um, so it didn't just sort of end there. We did tests. I mean, I, I said, let's, let's read this script and let's do tests. And I mean, I think I got, even if she had been good, I think the movie would have been good, but, she's great and she's what makes the movie great so there you have it i mean a star is born she's really magnificent i'm I'm looking at your imdb page by the way you've you've won a bunch of awards for directing for writing for screenplays you you even won a jonathan demi award in texas and uh you and your movies have been nominated over the years for academy awards for boogie nights for there will be blood but nothing yet from oscar and and do you think of those kinds of things when you're making a movie? Does it, does it matter to you? Yeah. You get up every day and you think (laughs) (laughs) you, you know, you have, you you tape up a little, little little photograph of an Oscar, you know, to the dashboard of your car, you drive into work and you think, you know, (laughs) no, Um, (laughs) no, it's nice to win an Oscar, though. Isn't sure, it? I, I, well, on, I wouldn't Paul. know if it is or not. I wouldn't know. Um, <laughs> I've seen a lot of other people stand up there, and, and it, seem, it seems like they're having fun. Um, uh, <laughs> but I, <laughs> no, um, the last thing on your mind is you are struggling to make a ten-hour day as the light is going down, uh, is 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 getting in a tuxedo and going to an award ceremony and losing an award. That's the last thing that's on your mind, you know, uh, <laughs> when you make a film. Maybe it's not. Maybe other people. Maybe other people do do think about it, but I don't. You you grew up in the entertainment business right here in Southern California. Your dad was for years the voice of the ABC television network. Saturday, Julie has a love-struck young suitor. We could go away together. But her heart's set on an older man on the love boat. Anyone of a certain age, like me, I'm 51 years old, can remember those dulcet tones of Ernie Anderson, who peddled Three's Company and Eight is Enough and Charlie's Angels on broadcast TV. How much did he influence you in your career path? Well, like any dad, he was a great influence. Um, But on the other hand, he wasn't like any other dad. He was, certainly wasn't like any other dads that were around me. Um, he was completely eccentric, completely independent. Um, he was significantly older than all the other dads. Um, my dad was in World War II. My dad was born in 1923. There was nobody else in my friend group that had dads like that. <laughs> um, so he was instantly kind of um, cooler. Um, I, re- I was a very unique person, unique personality. And, um, but I got to witness my toe in the show business was sort of following, following him around, going to ABC, going to the prospect and Talmadge studios. And, you know, it's funny. I always think about it as you finish a film, you, you find yourself in a dark room, like probably like the one you're in now with microphones around studio recording equipment, whether you're on the mix stage or in a final transfer, 
And I think I'm uh, here. I am. This is this is the life that my dad lived. You know, going around to these rooms, and it was just magical to me. The sort of camaraderie of the people that you, he worked with, the vending machine around the corner with the like stale coffee and candy, <laughs> and it's like I want that. I want to be. I want to be a part of that. Um, and here I am. Did you and your siblings practice saying things like your dad, like the love book? Did you do that? <laughs> I know you've done that before. Come on. No, no. Um, <clears throat> what I will tell you is that we knew we were in trouble when he would, would lower that, that register down. He says, you better clean that goddamn room up, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. <laughs> no, um, my, my brother has the voice. Um, he, my dad would always say, stop, stop, you know, say, stop talking through your nose to my sisters. Oh, wow. And they say, what are you talking about? He's like, you got to talk from your chest. The diaphragm, right? <laughs> like, you know, from way down below. Diaphragm. That's yeah. right. Director Paul Thomas Anderson, his new movie, Licorice Pizza, is out this weekend. Paul, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on today. That was great. So exciting to be on the radio. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's cool. Los Angeles. Give me a miracle. I just want out from this. I've done my share of helping with your defense. Dive into the underground of the 80s with one of its most passionate voices. I'm Deirdre O'Donoghue, host of this thing called Snap Every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday night between 10 p.m. and midnight. Saves my life, and I hope it does you some good, too. I kind of get the impression that it does. KCRW presents Bent by Nature. Listen now at kcrw.com slash bentbynature or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, some real-life L.A. characters star in the movie Licorice Pizza, like longtime L.A. City Councilman Joel Wax, whose political career was just getting started back in the early 1970s when the film was set. Actor Benny Safdie plays his character. Wax would go on to run for mayor two more times before leaving Los Angeles for New York City in the early 2000s. So, how does the real Joel Wax feel about his fictionalized portrayal? He joins me right now to talk about it from New York. Thanks for being here, Councilman. It's my pleasure. How are you? I'm doing well and, and honored that you come on the show. I mean, you know, the early 1970s seems like a real inflection point for L.A., moving from, you know, the old Los Angeles of Republican Sam Yorty, the mayor, to, to Tom Bradley, you know, the city's first black mayor and a time of progressive politics. Talk, talk a bit about how you see that time in L.A. Well, th that's very true. In fact, when I first ran for the city council, when I got elected in 1971, uh, I beat uh, a Republican incumbent, uh, uh, Jim Potter, uh, who had been in, uh, in office for a substantial amount of time. And his father-in-law was also a Republican congressman from the Santa Barbara area. Uh, in the San Fernando Valley, almost all of the elected officials at the time uh, were Republicans. Um, of course, city government is nonpartisan, and uh, I just ran as somebody who wanted to be uh, an honest, hardworking councilman, and, and I asked for support from Republicans and Democrats, and, um, um, it, but it was really a, a time of transition. Uh, Tom Bradley had run in 1969 and lost to Sam Yorty, and then in 1973, he finally beat Sam Yorty. And, as the years went by after that, more and more uh, Democrats got elected. Um, uh, people like uh, Howard Berman and others were getting elected to, to seats in the city and state and, and federal government that had previously been uh, held by Republicans. The movie highlights your political career, but it also touches on your personal life as well. Would, would you mind if... We talk a little bit about that. No, that's uh, a, a meaningful part of it. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, have you seen the movie and its portrayal of you? I I did see it. Uh, I saw a preview of it uh, recently. Yeah, your your character in the movie is 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 closeted, which which you were back then. You you didn't come out publicly as gay until the late nineteen nineties. Yeah, well, in nineteen in nineteen seventy one, when I ran for the city council. I first got elected, and in 1973, which was the race for mayor that's depicted in the movie, no, you have to remember, nobody 
in the history of the United States at any level, city, county, state, or federal, no one in history had ever, ever been elected as an open gay candidate. This was before Never. Harvey Milk, by the way. This was at least five years before. The city council race was five years before that. The first was, uh, I think, Elaine Noble in Massachusetts, ran for the state legislature, I think around 76 or so, Harvey in San Francisco. But in 1971, when I first got elected, <clears throat> and in 1973, the time depicted in that movie, no one in history had ever been elected as an openly gay candidate. Now, the good news is things do change. And today we have, you know, we have Pete Buttigieg married to Chastain, and hopefully I think one day will become president of the United States if I have my way. So th things change. And that's really the healthy thing to, for people to remember when they look at a movie like this and see things depicted 50 years ago, um, Many people weren't alive then, but as someone who is, was alive then and is still alive today, I can look back and see the enormous changes have been made. And one of the areas where they have been made particularly so is, is in the gay and lesbian community, trans community. It's an remarkable change. So change occurs, and, but the movie was accurate in that sense at the time. What was fictional was I didn't have a boyfriend. I was kind of surprised to watch the movie and say, Who's that boyfriend? Because I didn't have a boyfriend at the time. Now, some things, some things don't change. It's still hard to get a boyfriend, <laughs> but that's a different issue. Did, did anyone try and dig up dirt on you in that campaign or, or any campaign? Yeah, I mean, in those days, it was, it was always understood. It was always understood that uh, people were, would, would, would try to get dirt on you, whether, and it could be your opponents, it could be people who might have wanted to blackmail you. It could have been the police and law enforcement who were often prying into it was It was always, I mean, we used to pick up the phone when the phone rang and say, hi, J. Edgar, because we just assumed that the phone was always tapped and all. That, that's what it was like in those days. That's what it was like because if you were a school teacher, you could be fired for being oh, gay. If you were uh, working in a law firm, you would never become a partner if you found out that you were gay. A lot of people married purely as a way of covering that up. That was something I never was willing to do. Uh, but it, it, it was really difficult, but that's what it was like. And yes, so there were clearly uh, uh, people always trying to find out, you know, is he or isn't he? Yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't be, but for, I mean, it was, it was years later, even, before the Briggs proposition, right? Prop 6 came to be in, 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 in California, right? To, that would allow for the firing of teachers and, and other employees. That's right. And it was around that time that we had that wretched woman in Florida, Anita Bryant, who was, uh, was uh, crusading against uh, uh, people based on sexual orientation. And I introduced and got passed in the city council in the late 70s, the most comprehensive law in the United States prohibiting discrimination against people based on sexual preference or sexual orientation in housing, in public accommodations, in government, uh, in business, in finance. And that was a, a, a landmark legislation, but it was in response to like people like Briggs and Anita Bryant and all who were crusading against a uh, gay community. You resigned your council seat in 2001 and moved to New York. That's to, right. To serve as president of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. You're still there to this I'm, day, as a matter of fact. It's 20 years now, and I'm still still the president at the Warhol Foundation. We're, we're doing really, really well, basically supporting, according to Andy's will, we're supporting the visual arts in America. Uh, we're the largest, really, funder of contemporary visual arts programming. We support a lot of organizations in Los Angeles. Was leaving L.A. hard? Um, well, I spent 50 years of my life in L.A., and I was on the city council for 30 years. So that was a long time, and I had a deep commitment there. It wasn't hard because I also love New York, and it's a very different lifestyle, but I love New York. And it, I also, it was in a way hard leaving politics. I was in the middle of my eighth four-year term, but again, I, I was thrilled to get the job at the Warhol Foundation, where on a national level, 
I could do some of the things I tried to do in LA in terms of supporting the arts in Los Angeles. I could now do it on a national level. So um, it wasn't hard only in the sense that I had an equally good job and an equally good opportunity. And um, here I am at 82 and I just upped my contract for two more years. May, may, you, may you stay there for a long, long time and, uh, and be successful in, in that role, sir. I, I do appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Joel Wax, who served on the L.A. City Council from 1971 to 2001, his early political career portrayed in the new film, Licorice Pizza. Councilman, thank you. It's my pleasure. Good luck to you. Bye-bye. Well, that sadly is the end of our time for this evening and for this week. Wishing you a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. In our place tomorrow, another great episode of KCRW's podcast, Bent by Nature, the story of Deidre O'Donoghue, the influential DJ who created the show called Snap, a radio home for indie music and culture in 1980s L.A. We, however, will be back on Monday to talk about all that food that will no doubt be wasted on Thanksgiving, or really on any day, in many ways. That's Monday on this program. Check out kcrw.com slash GLA and hear any show. Subscribe to the podcast. You don't miss a thing at kcrw.com slash GLA. And get the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Catherine Barnes, Jackie Sedley, Phil Richards, Amy Ta, Sue Margulies, and Christian Bordall all had eyes and ears and hands on the product you heard this evening. I'm Steve Chit. Take us again. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for your time and ears. Have a great night.